welcome everyone. Uh, I have the honor of kicking off this webinar series this week, uh, Gains for Grains, and we're all happy to have you and we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so we've got an exciting week ahead of us. Uh, my name is Michelle Thompson and I'm joined today by Gerard Grayling and we have the pleasure of presenting the Capturing the Canola Opportunity. So uh, we'll get started with that right away here. We also today are joined by a special guest. Quick Dick McDick is on the call and I see he was on just a second ago. So he might be popping in throughout the conversation, but we also have a special video from him at the end of the presentation and then we'll have the chance for a Q and A. So keep your questions till the end for him and um, we'll welcome him in a little bit. So to get things going, this presentation is being recorded. So let's keep the questions and the conversation to at least PG-13, please. And if you would like a copy, please let anyone of your reps know and we will get you a copy of that uh, emailed to you as soon as we can. So like I said, we've got a, a pretty exciting week ahead of us, the Games for Grains with the Cargill Saskatchewan team. So for the rest of the week, every morning at nine till 10, we have some different topics coming up. <laughs> Tomorrow, we're talking about wheat and durum. Thursday, we're talking about pulses. And Friday, we're finishing off with the oat and barley acres. So please, if you haven't already registered um, for anything else, please do so. And you'll be entered to win every single day. We're drawing for $250. So if you're looking to win some money and want to learn some more, um, please register for some more webinars if you have not done so already. And just follow the link that brought you here today. And with that, we'll get things going. Do you need the next slide? <laughs> So my name is Michelle Thompson. I'm the market development agronomist for the Balcaris, Raymore, and Winyard territories. Um, I live in the small town of Saskatchewan, and I live on a farm with my husband, who is a fifth generation farmer on a mixed operation. And a uh, fun fact about myself, me and my husband are welcoming our first baby in May. So we planned that correctly, but we're very excited about it and uh, adding one more thing into the chaos of spring. <laughs> Next slide. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Gerard Grading, um, Grain Marketing Advisor for South Saskatchewan. Uh, my area would be south of Davidson, all the way down to Assiniboia past Congress, uh, all the way up to Balcaris, Raymore, Wynyard area. Um, fun fact about me is I can speak three languages, and yeah, that's about it. So let's jump into maximizing canola yields. So today we are we're facing unbelievable prices in canola, as we're all aware, and the future is looking extremely bright in canola. So the question I know you all are asking is, how can I take my canola to the next level? Today I want to focus on three main points. I want to acknowledge that variety <laughs> selection and weed control play a vital role in setting up potential yields. Um, and are the basis to a great canola crop. But what I wanted to focus on with these three main points is how can we build on that base and increase that potential? So today I want to discuss fertilizing the potential, nutrition top up, and fungicide discussion. Sorry, can someone delete or um, mute all their lines, or can I have one of my cohorts please go through and mute people just to keep the chatter down? Am I muted? Sorry. Can hear you. Thanks. Okay, next slide, Janina. So fertilizing for potential. So fertilizer is one of the biggest costs in crop production, but it also is one of the most important investments we can make. Crop requires nutrients to grow, and with bigger and bigger bushels pouring into combines, what fertility should we be considering to ensure we aren't losing an opportunity? So 
I love using crop removal rates and com- in relation to yield goals. They are by far the best numbers we can use to put into perspective what fertility a crop is really going to need. So today I'm just going to use the five-year Saskatchewan average, which is a 40 bushel canola crop. This might, I know for many of you, this probably is not an average, but uh, just for numbers wise, this was a, a good number to go off of. So when we put, plug that in and put in the removal rate, we're looking at a 40 bushel canola crop requiring 132 pounds of nitrogen, 42 pounds of phosphorus, 20 pounds of potassium, and 24 pounds of sulfur. And then also adding on to that requirements in grams of boron, zinc, and copper. Copper being minimal, um, boron and zinc being more important for a canola crop. So what I wanted to show with these numbers is that um, for many of you who are achieving a 40 bushel crop, we might not be at these numbers for what we're putting down. So what are we losing an opportunity? And fertility is a great way where we can put in that base fertility program in order to achieve a yield goal. And I understand rain is by far the biggest factor that's going to determine yield, but If we short ourselves on fertility, we are losing that opportunity of what a great year could be if we all of a sudden get that perfect environmental condition. Nitrogen, as we know, is a really important part to any crop production. Phosphorus is something that I've been uh, encouraging us to increase just over the years because in Saskatchewan, we have very low phosphorus levels in our soils. And for some of us, it's probably due to the soil type that we're fighting with. Potassium is also something that I've been encouraging many people start implementing into a fertility plan across the farm, not just on cereals, but in canola as well. Um, Saskatchewan is naturally really high in potassium, but a lot of that potassium is not always available. And actually, because we haven't been fertilizing for potash, those levels are getting lower and lower, and we're also depleting our chloride levels, which is another really important micro that comes with applying potash. If you're wondering why you should be adding potash into your blend, potash or potassium plays a really important role in water use efficiency and how the rest of the nutrients are actually moved throughout the plant. So in years like this, when we've been um, faced with maybe drier conditions than normal, having a plant that's able to manage that water stress and manage the moisture that it has, that's a really important thing to implement into a fertility plan. So if you haven't already, start looking at implementing some potash. And of course, sulfur. We know sulfur is definitely one of the, I'd almost say the second biggest nutrient we need to consider in a canola rotation. It goes hand in hand with nitrogen and is really important for canola flowering capabilities and also in our protein. And um, if you're dealing with specialty oils, really important factor if you're looking for a grading um, on the specialty side. So Sulfur is definitely one thing that we want to keep encouraging putting down and in balance with a nitrogen plan. So with all those numbers in mind, we can put together some base fertility plans going from good, better, up to best and trying to balance out to those nutrients as best we can. So with good, these numbers are going to be lower than that 40 bushel removal rate. Um, But what I like about this is we are still trying to push those levels above what um, might have been done in the past, aiming for 100 pounds of nitrogen. Um, 30 pounds of phosphorus is a good, I'd say, a base level to be on the phosphorus side. No potash in that blend, but that, I'd say, is probably pretty normal at the moment for a lot of canola blends. And then starting with a base level of 15 pounds of sulfur. So with this, I'd say is probably pretty basic um, and be a good level to start at. So that's why we're saying it's good. (laughs) With better, we're moving a lot closer to that nitrogen removal rate, increasing our FOSS up to that 40 pounds, which I would say is a really good place to be um, on that level. Starting to implement some potash with a 10 pounds there and then increasing our sulfur up to 25 pounds, which is right where we'd want to be for that removal rate of a 40 bushel crop. 
With this one, I also implemented Procote BCMD. So we're starting to implement um, some micros into that plan as well. So you might hear agronomists and sales reps talk about micros more and more, just because we're starting to see those micro levels really drop on soil sample results. And if you haven't already, I would really encourage you to get some soil sampling done. If you haven't done so in a couple years, just to see where your soil sample levels are. Because I should have mentioned this nutrient removal rate does not factor in residual um, fertility. So you might not have to push things as high as that level, like 132 pounds of nitrogen, just because you might have a lot of residual nitrogen, but you don't know until you see that soil test result. So, sorry, going back to Procote BCMD, for any of you who, are, who aren't aware of Procote BCMD, what this product is, it's actually a fertilizer coating and it goes on to a granular blend. And you're, what you're doing is you're adding grams of both all BCMD, so boron, copper, manganese, and zinc onto every single granular of um, granular fertilizer. And preferably, I would like to see this go on a uh, FOSS blend. So if you're dealing with 1152, or any microessential products, so S15, S10, um, MESZ, anything like that. And then looking at the best, we're really starting to push the nitrogen level um, going up to 140 pounds, which might seem like a lot. But if you look at that 40 bushel canola crop, if you're starting to push it into the 60s, for a lot of you, I know you are, um, you're starting to need a lot more nitrogen and you need to put that into into factor on your plans and make sure that you are accommodating those bushels that you are pulling off of those fields. Same with the 50 pounds of FOSS. That's quite a bit and can get pretty expensive. But like I said before, if we're pushing those crops, then this goes hand in hand with the rest of your, your crop rotation as well. If you're pushing everything every single year, starting to have some buildup on that phosphorus side can really help you. And actually with this, with the 20 pounds of potash, we are hitting that 40 bushel canola crop removal rate. So that would be your overall best target on the potash side to start increasing that potash level. And then going into the 35 pounds of sulfur. So like I said, that would be getting us closer to that 50 and 60 bushel canola crop removal rate. And again, adding Procote BCMZ at four liters to ensure we're starting to put on those micro um, packages into those fields. And sorry, I should have mentioned with questions, please feel free to use the chat box. We'll be monitoring that. Um, otherwise, please feel free to unmute yourself and I'll open it up here for questions for a little bit. If there's no questions, we'll just move on. So a little plug here for Gerard's fancy tool. Um, this, hold on. <laughs> so the Fancy Farm Maximizer program. Oh, sorry, Janina, you can go forward. So using this fancy tool that Gerard's gonna go through further on here, we can actually type in and enter comparing all the good, better, best programs that we've created. And um, we are using granular fertilizer, of course, um, just because uh, it was easy numbers to use, but I know there are so many different factors on equipment and uh, what kind of fertilizer blends are out there. But using a tool like this, we can compare the return on investment that we can see with each of these different products or different programs and the expected yield response that we're going to see. Um, I'll let Gerard talk on this further because he has more in-depth numbers later on. And just a question on seed safety with seed place fertilizer. So yeah, that's going to play a really important part in what you can and cannot do. Um, and of course, equipment is going to be probably your defining factor of what you can and cannot put down. If you're starting to put it or push your fertility up into that better and best, it might require um, spreading ahead of time just because you don't have the capability to fill a tank every 10 acres um, to achieve those high nitrogen and phosphorus levels. 
And then same with the seed safety. We can only push the phosphorus in the seed row so far. Um, and depending if you're using an 1152 blend, um, if you're blending the 1152 with AMS or potash, then we see even less product going down in furrow. If you're using an S15 and S10, um, our comfortability goes up a little bit with how much you could put down in the seed row, but again, that too has restrictions. And it's gonna be also based on um, environment of the time. Right now with drier conditions, of course, we don't wanna see as much fertilizer going down in furrow, but in wetter years, seven years ago, we were comfortable with higher rates of FOSS going down in, in the furrow. So there's a lot of different factors. So if you have specific questions, reach out to your agronomist and we can go through those in more depth of what your equipment can and can't do. All right, next slide, good question. Foliar nutrition top-ups. So, foliar nutrition is to be used as a fertilizer enhancement and should never replace your fertilizer. So, we want to take advantage of an opportunity, opportunity with foliar nutrition. And my thinking is if you can maximize your foliar that's going in furrow, then we can use foliar nutrition to really top up that opportunity and hopefully see a better uh, yield in season based on the opportunity that you've been presented with. So where I would position this is if you're looking at really great crop, crop conditions, that canola crop's looking really thick, healthy, uh, we've got perfect weather and um, just overall you're, you're pretty positive over how far you can take that canola, the older nutrition has a really good fit here. Um, it also has a fit if you've been faced with the opposite and all of a sudden we're faced with an environmental stress like hail or insect damage. Using something on the foliar nutrition can, can really help a crop recover from these um, situations and hopefully regain you back that yield opportunity that might have been lost if you hadn't reacted. Some specific products I have here mentioned here is Yoravita Flex. I really like Flex because it's kind of like a multivitamin for crop production. You got a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of phos, and a little bit of potash in there, along with boron, zinc, and molybdenum. What's really great about the mix of these nutrients is they're all kind of stress management nutrients. So, and they're used to help push that plant and help them manage the nutrients that they have and move them to where that plant needs them to go. So in a situation where you have a really good looking crop, you're kind of topping it up with a multivitamin and it's going to push that yield potential a little bit farther. But in a stressful condition, it's gonna help that plant manage that stress and hopefully push it past that stressful factor and put it back into growing situation. The really easy product to use, very basic, one liter per acre across any crop, not just canola, um, but for canola, we're aiming for that four to six leaf, it can go down with your first application or your first in-crop, but um, technically with your second in-crop, a pretty good, easy way to go. And over two years of trial data, and um, that's just from one presentation that I've seen, they saw an average of three bushel increase. So that's pretty impressive with a product like Flex that's really easy to use. The other product I wanted to mention is the Yara Vita Bortrax. So this, like I said, would be more for a stressful condition um, where we had hail or insect damage using something like Bortrax, which is straight boron. We know that boron plays a really important part in stress management. So by applying that boron at that stressful timing, you are encouraging that plant to manage that stress and move through it. Um, with this one, this past year, we had a hail event go through up in the Winyard territory, and we reacted with Bortrax five days after that hail event, and we saw anywhere from a two to 10 bushel increase, depending on the hail damage, and it actually saved the um, the harvest sample. The, the greens were reduced in anything that was untreated, and where we put the boron, we actually didn't see that green show up in our sample. So that was pretty interesting as well. Just wanna put mention here down at the bottom, always check 
um, tank mixability, crop safety, and active ingredients when you're looking at foliars. Just because there's so many different products out there and um, not all of them are going to get you the responses that you wanted. Um, some can cause crop damage and um, some can cause you a lot of stress in the tank and you might be really kicking yourself after. So really do your research on them. The reason I mentioned Flex and Vortrack is I've seen them go tank mixed with anything and go on many different situations and I'm pretty confident in their safety with uh, canola specifically and on any crop really. All right, next slide. All right, sorry, any questions on foliars? All right, moving on. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is the fungicide decision. And I know I want to address the elephant in the room. Sclerotinia and fungicide on canola is always a really tough decision. And I will completely agree with you when I say it does not always pay. The point I want to make by including this today is that it's a really important tool that we have that in the end could save that opportunity and that yield potential of a really good canola crop and shouldn't be disregarded. And when you're making a full far or canola full fertility plan, it shouldn't be the first thing that you disregard and throw out of the plan. Because as we know, environmental conditions change so quickly that it should still be kind of in the back of your mind and maybe kind of factored into your, your plan that a sclerotinia fungicide might still be required. So when we're looking at the real fit for a fungicide is evaluate the risk of infection. So I included here the Canola Council chart. And what we're looking at is um, considering your rotation. If you've had a pretty intense canola rotation, one to two years, probably a good idea to maybe spray those quarters or those fields just because the chances of infection are really high. Um, we probably haven't been faced with this, but um, disease incidents and last host crop, when was the last time you really saw sclerotinia come up in your fields? And um, are we facing that again coming, coming into this season? Crop density, if you've got a really thick crop and we are getting really humid situations in the end of June into July, probably a really high chance that sclerotinia is going to be coming into that crop. Rain in the last two weeks, of course, we know it takes moisture to um, grow sclerotinia. So that's probably the biggest factor and one thing we haven't had in the past two years. But that being said, humidity also plays a really important part. So if things have been really humid or we have gotten that rain in the last two weeks, should be something you consider. And um, like you said, weather forecast, whether we're getting rain, that humidity and um, using charts like the regional risk for apothecia development and just reading those fields of where you know you might have had sclerotinia in the past and um, factoring all that into that decision. You might just want to select those best acres. If you're growing specialty canola, maybe putting it on your specialty because you want to protect those acres. You've invested the most into them, so you want to make sure that you get the most yield. Um, and also using something like a petal test um, those are kind of cool. Um, the only thing I say about the petal test is you're collecting those petals probably right at the time you should be spraying. Okay. So the petal I mean, test is kind of more something you use to tell you that you should have sprayed. <laughs> Michelle, can you see the couple of questions in the chat? Yes. I'm just going to... Uh, can spraying a fungicide prolong the harvest? Um, honestly, I have not seen like a green up occur after a sclerotinia application. It's not like your fusarium where you can see that green up happen in your canopy. Um, it's what you're protecting is those petals and those petals are naturally going to fall no matter what you spray on them. And then that's what's protecting from sclerotinia infection. So with a sclerotinia product, I not, I don't see a, an increase 
or a prolongation of to your harvest timing. And then what are my thoughts on a black plague fungicide? That's a tough one. Um, honestly, we have seen a little more black leg infection come up. And I'd say it's definitely a variety thing we see. If you're worried about black leg, I would say your first protection is a really good variety. Um, the varieties we have available have really good black leg genetics in them. So we shouldn't necessarily have to use a black leg fungicide. That being said, if you know you've got a, a variety on farm that is more susceptible to black leg, um, I wouldn't disregard it and maybe just do a strip and see if you see the right response to it. One thing that's actually interesting about black leg is actually can really pay off to use it early on in the season because you can get early infection of black leg even at cotyledon stage. And then if you have additional insect damage like flea beetles, that can cause even more infection. So we've actually been seeing some responses with using a black leg product um, near your first pass. So again, that's something I would consider, but I'd say look for a variety that's really strong on black leg first. And hey, Michelle, I had a question. It's quick, Dick here. Hey. Hey, I was just wondering specifically what size of elephant you wanted me to have in the room and uh, what I should be feeding it. I just can't seem to get past that first part of the slide. <laughs> I think it's a big elephant, so you might need a lot of food. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do see if I can do some livestock contracting here and get back to you on that. Thanks. Good luck selling that one. I don't think elephants are very popular on the market right now. Go tell that one to the elephant producers out there. They're going to be very upset to hear that. <laughs> and sorry, guys, just catching up on questions here. Uh, would we want to spray in the event of hail damage? Um, a foliar nutrition or a fungicide? And Danielle, you can comment after or mention. Fungicide. Yeah, actually, sometimes I would dual app apply that. I would apply a fungicide in with a foliar, like say, board tracker flex. The reason being you want to protect from further infection. Um, and we do see really good responses by adding a fungicide into a uh, into a foliar on top of a okay and for black leg protection yeah and especially for black leg because like i said black leg kind of likes to attack where there's already been damage done so um that would be kind of my go-to and then one comment i've been doing petal tests for five years and would not make a decision on fungicide without it so yeah that's really good to know so using something like a pedal test can be really beneficial so if you haven't tried a pedal test already maybe that's something you should look at and to finish this off so when you're considering a fungicide and i'm talking clear tinea but yeah black leg also plays an important role um there's lessons to be learned by checking your stubble and scouting at harvest so when you're in that combine or in that swather checking for those uh, highly ripened plants and a lot of shelling and that might indicate that you may have had more sclerotinia pressure come in than you expected and in that situation learn from that lesson and remember that for future so that you know you do have the potential for sclerotinia infection in future if we get the right environmental conditions so remembering everything that you see while you're in that combine can really pay off in the future. And quick dick, everyone's saying peanuts, so that might be the thing to feed the elephant. <laughs> uh, does anybody know where I can get a bulk drum or a semi-load of peanuts nearby? Local co-op, local elevator, anybody? They don't seem like something that we, you know, produce much of here in Canada. Or hey, maybe that's an opportunity. We're starting to grow peanuts now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so uh, my legal team will get in touch with you. I'm going to need to cut off that for bringing the idea to the table. Thanks very much for that. Appreciate that. Yeah. 
next slide, Janina. So to recap, um, just to go through all of that, and I'm sorry if we went through that pretty quick, but um, considering your yield goals and fertilizing for those goals so that you're not losing an opportunity with the fertilizer you're putting down, use foliar nutrition to enhance your crop potential, not define it. Um, if you're using foliar nutrition to define it, you might be disappointed because reaction rates might not always be on time. And um, sometimes the opportunity you thought was there wasn't actually there. So that'll be lost time and lost investment on your side. And just don't discard the fungicide tool. There's lots of times when it really does pay off and we do still see that yield response by using a sclerotinia fungicide and we don't want to lose that opportunity. And um, see a really good canola crop be infected with 50% sclerotin, yes. So that's all I had for tips today. Any other questions that have come up? Otherwise, I will hand it off to Gerard. Thanks, Michelle. Um, talking about market sales and um, risk management, uh, in general, um, risk management is probably one of the best kept secrets out there. And one of the reasons why is the first rule of risk management is nobody talks about it. The second rule of risk management is nobody talks about it. So, do you need to turn to the next slide? Um, so, Market Sense uh, is a consulting program where we customize the program to fit your specific needs uh, by talking, by, by taking the time and the time to really listen to you and understand your uh, interest and your challenges in your business and what opportunity they could be. By partnering with us jointly, we can create a fully customized plan in unlocking more profits and addressing your business needs. Um, let's go to the next one, Julia, please. So market sense is kind of based on three legged stool. And for today's purposes, we only will focus on the individual situation uh, the risk management tool and the advisory part. Um, as you can see here, I mean, like we have the individual situation with one leg, the market direction, the risk management tools, and the advisory report. Under risk management, uh, it's a huge education part as well. And we pride ourselves there in that the Cargo's had about 14 different tools that we can use to manage risk. And we, we pride ourselves in that we can educate our clients on managing the risk accordingly to their needs. Can you go to the next one, please, Janina? So adding to Michelle's presentation, like this is our fancy tool and no, it doesn't need batteries. Uh, it's part of the program and it's customizable to your specific needs. To dial in what Michelle is presenting, like our number one, our good option, our better option. And if you can scroll to the next one, we have the, the best option and then Michelle's options as well. So the program allows us to run what if scenarios and see how that would play out in a probability on our farm. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next one, please. So if we look at look at it another way, I mean, it, it kind of brings us down to like, what are we expecting for yield? How does it expect? How does it work on fertilizer rates? How is, what is the expenses? What is our expected return on it? And what are our break even levels on it? Can you just click through it, uh, Janina? So go one more, please. So on the number ones, I mean, you can see on this farm overall, I mean, to grow a bushel of canola, I mean, it's $196 uh, expenses plus the 166 overhead we have penciled in there. What I would presume is an overhead farm, but we have the opportunity to change it and customize it on this program. Um, using the three or the four different options, I mean, we can see what the input expenses are going to be. And then if you look at column two, I mean, it gives us our net profit per acre as well. So for this exercise, if Quick Dick decided to run with Michelle's option and he thought like she's the gospel, I mean he had he has the potential to put down $107 per acre of profit. Hence, if we do get rain and we get the moisture profile. If you look at column three where the risk profile is, I mean it breaks it down to like what is our break-even yield, a break-even price. And if you look at column four, when we have the opportunity to target a margin percentage on the end there as well, which gives us those four green tick marks. Um, and we can customize that to what our customer wants. You can go to the next one, please. So 
how does how does how do we manage tools like like I like I say like we have about fourteen different tools and I'll be focusing on two today. Um, I'm going to start on new crop and how we can use these current prices, and then we'll get into old crop. So first, I'm going to talk about minimum price puts, and we had some user successes this year with them, and I'll go through the math in there with it as well, so we can see how it works out. So a minimum price put is the right, but not the obligation to sell your marketing position at the price you protect it. You can just go through them, please, Janina. A put gains value if the market falls. A put is worth it if it's worthless if the market goes up. And this might, might sound screwed, but that's exactly what we want to happen. Like we're buying the insurance for the house not to burn down. And if the house doesn't burn down, Hopefully the house appreciates in value and we can sell the house at a higher price. So that's kind of the, the best case scenario that we want to do. Uh, puts have an expiry date, I mean like every insurance out there, I mean you have to like renew them yearly. So, and we have to at attack them to any type of contract. You don't have the futures or basis secured. So this is an ideal contract for hedging yourself in the future if you want to just want to secure the space or the price that you want to protect. So how does the, how does the math look at this? Um, can you just scroll to the next one, please? When to use this contract? You will use this contract if you want to ensure you have protection in the form of a floor price. Um, if you're worried that the market might fall, but you're not ready to sell yet, you have production risk and stuff like that. Um, you're uncomfortable at forward contracting. So there's a bunch of different tools that we can find a fit on the farm to find your comfort level, if, if I can say it like that. Uh, just scroll on to the next one, please. Um, so here's a, my, my apologies, this was drawn up last week, Friday, um, and this is the November 21 canola chart. Um, as you guys can see, like the 550, there would be the, the level that we are looking at. It's a little bit higher in the last three days, so we'll see what happens with the USDA today. So in this scenario, we are planning to buy a 550 put option to protect the 550 level. Can you just scroll to the next one, please? So how does how does the math work? So we decided today, like we want to protect the 550 levels. We're not securing the futures because we do know there's production risk. We are taking the basis of a 30 under basis. We don't have to take that basis now, but for this exercise, Let's say Quick Dick McDick's farm decided that's a good basis. We haven't seen those basis in a long while, so we're going to just roll with that. We have our investment fee, the $30 under what our put cost us. So by using this math, worst case scenario, if the house burns down, we are protecting 490 futures or 1111 canola. Um, we have to price the, price the futures or exit the position by expiry October 22nd. So from here on to October 22nd, 2021 is a lot of time and a lot of stuff can happen to adjust our strategy and plan for every case scenario that there is. Let's go to the next one, please. Gerard, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So we probably have a lot of growers on here that are gonna say, okay, that's all great, but what happens if I don't grow a crop? So if we don't grow a crop, I mean, you can view a minimum price put as a, I don't want to say false manure, but you can use it as a false manure contract. Um, but in that case, I mean, we won't fix the basis. You don't have to fix the basis. Um, if we do protect this 550 and we don't grow a crop, like my dad always used to say, it's like, I mean, 600 times zero is still zero. So um, if you don't grow a crop, I mean, we'll just be liable for the investment fee. So the insurance cost of the, the $30 um, put that we that we used. Happy with that, Sherry? Yep. Yep. Thanks, Gerard. Uh, just scroll to the next one, please. So how, how does the math work? Like, so in this scenario, we're going to decide, like, we bought the 550, mean the market's going to the moon. So what happens? You can just scroll through it, click through it, Janina. Um, the market kind of, after the USDA, kind of just do, do, does a little dip. And all of a sudden, I mean, like, there's a huge drought, or we don't know what, China's coming back to the market mean we don't have enough canola for, for all the supply out there or the demand out there and the market goes up to like 650. So how does the, the how does the the calculations work when canola is at 650 in harvest time or closer to October uh, 2021? 
just scroll to the next one. So how the, ma the math works behind this, like if we owned the November 550 futures and from now till October 22nd, we price our futures at 650 or anywhere between, the value of our put is zero because I mean, we're moving against the put. So we pay the insurance, the house didn't burn down, the market is appreciating, we have the opportunity to sell the house for a higher value. So we locked in the futures at 650, we locked in our basis at uh, 30 under, we have our investment fee of $30, so the contract value would be 590 or 13.38 per bushel. Our put is worthless in this scenario, but that's kind of exactly what we wanted it to happen. It's kind of like having your cake and eating it too. We have the opportunity to put fully to participate in the market and we are selling at a higher value. Just scroll to the next one. So that's all fine and dandy. So what happens if this market drops? I mean, what happens if we suddenly see 30 million acres and we have the biggest crop on record. So just click through it, Janina. We still have our 550 put protected. All of a sudden this market just tanks and it goes down to like 480 levels, which we have seen in the last two, three years. Uh, so there is there always that risk that that could happen again. Um, I would say this year where we saw prices appreciate at harvest, I mean, it's probably the exception to the rule, because normally at harvest times we should see prices deteriorate or go lower. So how does the math work? On a, if we sell the futures at a 480, just click to the next one. So now we own the 550 put. Uh, from now to October 22nd, we price out, and in this example, well, we priced out at 480. So our value of our put is at $70. So we locked in 480 futures. We have a 30 under basis. Uh, we have our investment fee of $30. And my, my apologies to the math right there, the put value is not correct. It should be. Uh, for 70, but we are getting a 40, $70 return on our investment or on the put value. So that brings us back to like a 4, 490 level or the 1111. So the put payout brings us back to our contracted price, our floor level. So for illustration purposes, to so dumb it down for quick deck, um, just go to the next one. And you can just scroll through it. So the price peaks out at 550 and it goes down to like 480. We have our 490 level here and just keep clicking Janina. So our put option is acting like a magnet and it's pulling us up from our 480 levels or lower levels to our 490 or 1111 canola that we protected. Just scroll through it. Okay, thanks. Uh, just go on for Where forward. exactly can we find one of those magnets kicking around, Gerard? I could use that in several different applications on my life if possible. Well, <laughs> well, it, it only works on puts. I mean, it only works at the cargo contracts. I mean, like, it's a, it's a good illustration, I would say. But for live goals, I don't think there's a magnet big enough to fit your head on. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty, you're going <laughs> to be needing a pretty big magnet. Right there. <laughs> so from a, from a risk profile, like how this contract pays out is, um, if you look at the bottom axis, I mean, that is our security that we have on the farm. On the up and down axis, I mean, that is the opportunity we have. A minimum price I would view as a high security, high opportunity on the upside um, on this uh, potential grid. Whereas you can look at a flat out DD contract, I mean, is low opportunity on upside, but it's got high security because you know what you've locked in. And then you can just go to the next one. Any questions? Any questions on puts except magnets? So you might tell me, like, well, that's all just fine and dandy. That's new crop. Like, I don't care about new crop yet. I still have canola in the bin. And I sold $11 canola or $12 canola. So, how do we manage that risk? How do we manage the regret management part as well? So, Luckily for you, we do have a contract for that as well. And like I mentioned, and I'll probably mention a couple of times more, we have about 14 tools and we pride ourselves into find the right tool for the right growth or the right situation. So what's happening now is the canola market is probably setting up for once in a lifetime opportunities. And by using minimum rice calls, which in short is the opposite of puts, I mean, we can still participate in the market. So in this example, I mean, we decided to Let's say the red phoned up somebody, phoned up Quick Dick McFarms, 
and told him like, fourth of, fourth of December, I've got $12 canola, we should sell it. And he said, oh, well, that's pretty good. I mean, I can afford to buy peanuts for my elephant. I should sell $12 canola. Do you need to just click through? I like, I like where this is going. I like where your head's at here, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> so now we sell like on the 4th of December, and this, and this is a true example. I mean, I've got the proof to, to show you this. Um, on the 12th of the, the 4th of December, like we sell dollar canola. It was on a Friday. We had premiums, everything running. That weekend, when we went down to the local watering hole, um, talked around the coffee pot, following COVID restrictions, I would say, uh, we decided, well, I might have jumped the gun. Like $12 canola is not nearly good enough. I mean, this might go to the moon. Like, And we're reading the Western producer and everything, and this is just shaping up to go to the moon. The next day, Monday, you call me up. You tell me, like, well, I'm not happy with that call that you did on the $12 canola. Like, how can we still participate in the market? So we'll look at a couple of options, and we decided that we wanted to reinvest and buy back the July call. Just scroll to the next one. So we decided, like, well, why the July is, like, probably going to run out of canola in July. Um, July has a history of having higher prices on the seasonal chart, if you look at that. So... On the 7th of December, the Monday, we decided, right, we're going to buy a July call, a 570 call. You can just click through it, Janina. So we saw, sold the $12 canola. On the, we decided to buy a 570 call. We used an investment fee of $25. And as of Friday, the 7th of Jan, I mean that we made a profit or we had the value of $63 on that call just because the market kind of ran higher. But there's a catch to this because I mean, it's not done yet and we still have about 160 days left to still participate in this market. So how does the math work on this scenario that has already happened? Uh, just scroll to the next one. So we have our 570 strike. We paid an investment fee of $25 to participate in the market. Um, 75 bushels, 57 uh, cents per bushel. Uh, so using the $12 contract that we did on that Friday, and taking their investment fee off there, we are guaranteeing ourselves a worst case scenario of 11.43. So it's not the $12, but by doing this, we are opening up the upside and we have unlimited upside potential uh, on this contract. So the market goes up to 6.33, and my apologies, today is actually higher, it's probably another 20 bucks higher today. Um, so how does that work out? So we have a value of 63 or a value of a dollar 43 cents per bushel increase. And the, the great thing about this is we still have 168 day, days left before expiry. So we have all this time still in the market for a $25 investment cost. And because the 570 call is in the money and is currently at a value of 63 or $38 profit after the investment cost of 25, our current $12 contract price increases to $12.86 if we should decide to just pull the trigger today and say, well, I'm happy with the 80 cents six increase in my price. I participate in the market. That's enough to feed my elephant. So we're happy with that. But if the market just goes sideways, just click to the next one, please, Janina. Next one, please. So worst case scenario, I mean, if the market just goes sideways or it starts to drop, uh, no, that's one too far. One back, one back, other way. Yeah, there you go. So worst case scenario, if this market stays at 570 or drops, um, we'll see that investment cost depreciate. But we still have that 1143 banked, right? So without managing the risk, I mean, that will be our worst case scenario. So this is just a a quick visual on how we can use the right tools to still participate in the market. And I know there's a lot of guys that has regret management of selling $12 canola. Now that you can sell $14 canola by using these type of strategies, we are opening up the upside and we are still participating in the market. We won't see this every year, but like I said, there is a tool that fits every year that fits every farm that we should be using. So sure. just go to the, yeah. somebody, somebody has their hand up, I believe. Um, I can't see that. I just thought someone's high fiving. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, so you can just unmute yourself. Do you have a question? You can unmute yourself and just ask the question. All right. 
if you think of it later, let us know. Okay. Just scroll to the next one, please. So, like I said, I mean, to bring everything all together, like we focused on the individual situation, and this is just skimming through over it really quick. Um, and we focus on the risk management tools. And like I said, we pride ourselves on the risk management tools and the individual situation to find a fit on every farm. And as an advisor, I mean, we bring everything together. So we also pride ourselves in like there's a lot of farms that are transitioning from the younger generation to the to the younger generation. And um, education is really, really important because uh, you can ruin a good crop with one bad marketing decision. And I think that is crucial that we know what we are doing when it comes to education and managing the risk. Um, just scroll to the next one, please. So what does advisor support mean? Like you're not just buying me or one guy, you're buying a team um, that team that teams with you on the farm, like every client and we have meetings with every client, regular meetings, uh, virtual meetings now with COVID going on, uh, online support, support by phone, text, um, and we make we may we try to help make we, we try to make sense of all the noise that's out there. Like we kind of filter through it. Uh, we pride ourselves that we have a marketing plan and we stick to the plan. Uh, we tailor recommendations to the farm specific needs. And what do we mean by that? Is like, well, I only grow canola. That's the only hedgeable crop, and I'm pretty heavy in durum or pulses. I mean, we account for all that, and then we can work that into a cash flow. Uh, plan so we can manage all our bills and see where we can get more upside um, on that. So that's how 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 we bring everything together. And then the nice thing about Cargill is like because we have a global footprint. I mean, we have we have a broad view what's happening in the world. Uh, for example, we know what's happening now in Brazil, South America, uh, what the crop um, looks like down there. So we have firsthand experience, well not experience, but firsthand news what's happening there. So kind of. I won't say insider info, but damn close to it. Uh, next slide. So there's my pretty face. My mom keeps on telling me that I'm the prettiest boy she has ever seen. And there's all my contact info. Um, I would challenge everybody on this call to reach out to either your advisors or your reps or even myself. Because um, I do believe there is a fit on every farm for this program uh, or even the tools. If you don't be on the program, I mean, we are shaping up with once in a lifetime opportunities on canola um, and there is a tool that we can use to still participate in this market and uh, capture some of it. Um, any questions? Yeah, I had another question, Gerard. How do we get free coffee and donuts when we're doing this uh, virtually? It seems like, can you email me a donut when this is all done? I'm usually in this for the donuts, but that's just I, me. I, I like to come out to farms and drink the bad coffee, but like, I mean, like, we're kind of out of luck. <laughs> at the I mean, I'll, I'll I'll send you a virtual donut. I mean, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> any any questions? I if the dishes doesn't deliver to rural, so <laughs> we have to figure that out first. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I thought of something different instead of skip the dishes. I thought of coming up with a with a drunk driving app that would be called skip the ditches where they would come and pick you up from the farmer shop and take you back to your farm. I don't know. Maybe anybody in tech out there want to invest in this with me? Well, I mean, if, if you can, if you can train your elephant to just take you from the pub to your house, I mean, that should be easy. Just need to <laughs> Well, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Quick dick. I mean, uh, if there's no more questions for me. Thanks, Gerard. Just quickly, uh, so like I mentioned, we've still got some exciting content coming down the pipeline the rest of the week. So if you haven't registered for the rest of those today, and yeah, we'll just have a quick video here, and then we will kick it off with Mr. Quick Dick McDick. Just give me one second. I'm just going to pull up the video. For those of you who uh, haven't had a, a chance to see any of Quick Dick's material, this is uh, a little intro we'll do before we get started.
We're Tick Rick Tick coming to you from Saskatchewan here this morning, and this morning we will be talking about the greater guy. Have you noticed the poor bastard that runs these things is always at fault, no matter what's happening in the RM? Every single road in the RM that plowed the morning after a snowstorm, blame the greater guy. Oh yeah, go figure. Seven o'clock in the morning, road's not plowed yet. Probably driving around the countryside with the blade up. <laughs> Could you imagine if the greater went everywhere with the blade down? There would only be a five mile radius of roads graded around the town of Foam Lake. Another common complaint is to call the greater guy out for excessive coffee breaks. Oh yeah, yeah, 9.30, got a polar over for a coffee break. Heaven forbid you miss it. <laughs> Funny thing is, the farmer usually complains about the greater operator's excessive coffee breaks while they're having coffee at the elevator. Greater complaint number three, road not properly graded. So this is the time where the farmer picks apart the job that the grader operator has done. And in every case, the farmer becomes a seasoned grader operator. Canadian pipeline. Oh yeah, see they're going way too fast here. That's why it's so rough. Way too fast with the grader. Yeah, didn't have the blade down far enough here. That's what's wrong. Not down far enough. Oh yeah, pull all the grass out of the ditch and put it onto the road. That'll fix things, yeah. I scraped all the gravel off the road and threw it in the ditch. What am I paying taxes for here? Well, all the wrong pitch here. Wrong pitch. Yeah, now the water is going to pool on the road instead of shedding into the ditch. Oh, yeah. Heaven forbid we spend a few minutes on a rail crossing to make it manageable. Now, most of this is followed by the farmer stating, well, maybe I should get on that thing and show them how it's done. Could you imagine what would happen if they let one of the guys complaining about how poorly the grader is run actually get in the grader and try to run it? Uh, there are a lot of uh, levers in here and stuff. Uh, holy. Meanwhile, the farmers that are busy complaining about the grader operator are the ones trying to sneak an extra three ton per load to the elevator, and the grader operator is just doing his best to keep it from turning into absolute and complete garbage. This is Quick Dick Quick Dick signing off, reminding you if you went down the road and didn't or barely made her, the first person you blame is the guy driving the grader. <laughs> Catch you next time. Yeah, that hits way too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was a little slow on my end there. I think it kind of looked like I sent that in on an old analog cellular telephone to you guys. That might have been what happened. I'm not sure. I haven't checked with my local cellular provider lately. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you. Welcome, Quick Dick McDick. And we're going to open up for questions, so fire away, everyone, or feel free to throw them into the chat box here. Anything you've been dying oh. to ask this, this guy that you've been seeing for quite a while now on social media? Dying to see? Well, I'm not sure if I'm that popular of a guy, but uh, a, a book of poetry. Actually, uh, I've been writing one uh, every, every few minutes uh, that I have in the morning, usually during my morning constitution. So I just keep it on the back of the toilet. That's where I do most of my thinking, record some videos there and stuff. But you got to keep it pretty clean when you're trying to do that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if there's going to be a book of poetry. Some of it's kind of deep and dark and emotional. So we really have to keep an eye on, you know, what you get out to the public. You know what I mean? Um where am I from, Daniel? Is that, is, where am I from? So uh, from actually like Foam Lake. I grew up north of Tufnell, uh, live in Foam Lake, and have uh, land just north of Tufnell. It was a video about the canola. There's such thing as a canola grater? Oh, oh I see what you mean, grating the canola. No, see, I would never, ever run Chana guys grating canola because you, you, you – you, they're the kind of guys that you bring coffee and bring donuts to and whatnot, you know what I mean? Because they're kind of going to give you either number one or number two, right? So, <laughs> oh, Matt, how old is my beard? Uh, you know what? Only, t I think, two years old since I've been growing this. I used to work the oil field. So uh, I, I actually I, I actually have a chin underneath this thing and kept it exposed for years and years and years. And then I uh, just decided to cover it up. 
And now I think I'm to the point where I can't shave it anymore uh, because it'll just look like uh, I'll, I'll look like the reverse of Homer Simpson. It'll be white below my nose, I think, because I've had this through two summers. It's probably a disaster under there. Um, I have uh, I have not heard from Greta yet. I didn't know I was supposed to be waiting for a phone call from her, uh, but I would take a phone call from her, uh, I guess, if she wanted to have a conversation with me. I'm not sure how well the conversation would go and how PG-13 we would need to keep it. And I would, I don't know, probably wind up being arrested afterwards for saying something inappropriate. Um, where does the name Quick Dick McDick come from? You know what? I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, to be perfectly honest, my, my mind is an absolute and complete disaster. I pity that if they ever come up with a technology that lets you see inside of people's minds, Mine is not a place that you're going to want to go because I think it looks like a, a couple of odd people having a game of ping pong is probably what it would look like in there. Um, but uh, yeah, it just I was actually riding around in a log truck with Big Mustache Al one day and it just came to me to call myself Quick Dick McDick because I was like, that'll be a name that nobody would be able to find on social media. And it turns out that I was very, very, very wrong. Um, which leads into the So Candor, your question there, what made me start doing videos is... Uh, it, it it was just kind of an accident. Like I like, um, I was going to cut firewood with Big Mustache Al one day, and I, th I I I had no social media except Snapchat with like three people on it, and two of them were my brothers. And I was just like, this would be kind of funny if we made this into an infomercial for like somebody that sells hardwood north of Tufnell, Saskatchewan, and uh, that 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 was it. That's where Quick Dick all got started, and uh, it was. Uh, yeah, I, I never would have expected it to do what it was going to do. Who, who would watch some bearded guy from a place called Tufnell, Saskatchewan, and make jokes about Saskatchewan and the government? <laughs> um, am I considering going into politics? I would never consider going into politics. Could you imagine, like, having to wear good clothes and clean yourself up to go in front of people? I, that just doesn't seem like something that's appealing to me. Guys like me don't belong in politics because a lot of a lot of the the world is just not ready for for people like me. It, there's so many snowflakes need to get melted down that it would just be a disaster. Uh, I, I don't think a guy like me would make it very far in politics whatsoever. And that's it, that's when I see lots of this quick dick for PM stuff. Yeah, I would only consider doing that if you're allowed to live in Saskatchewan while you were prime minister, because I can't imagine going out to Ottawa. I kind of like it here in Saskatchewan where it's flat and there's a few less people. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly, Sherry. Uh, language would have to go. I would I have to ditch the beard if a guy got into got into politics there? I've seen some guys that keep a quaffed beard. I don't know what this guy that runs our country right now is trying to run for a beard. It looks more like a badger with a combined with a coyote that has a little bit of mange. But um, I guess that's you know up for personal opinion. Um, Oh, yeah. Hoodie with QDM on it. Nice. Appreciate the support. Yes, yeah, some Canadian-made merch like that. Uh, I'd have better socks. I, You know what? I wear Carhartt steel toe socks right now. Um, I found them years ago. I order them by the case. And uh, I wear steel toe socks that you don't have to wear steel toe boots. Um, they just, you kind of, you're always wearing your steel toe socks, but apparently I read the labeling wrong or they didn't mean, you know, that they had steel toes on them. They're just something you put underneath your steel toe boots. I don't know. They really need to work on their, on their marketing department of things, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if me sending socks to Eastern Canada is going to, is going to help our, our federal leadership right now, but I mean, I can never be a hundred percent sure on that. Uh, I, Katie, I cannot join ZZ Top because apparently I am too tall. I'm, I, I tried. I applied to their band a few years ago, um, and uh, I'm six foot two. And like those guys don't look like it, but they're they're tiny. Well, I can't call them. I got to be politically correct with what I refer to the height of the band of ZZ Top as, uh, because they're actually tiny. They're like a bunch of little minions running around all over the place, and just when they shoot them on on uh, on their music videos and stuff and make them look really tall but they're not they're like a bunch of little dogs or rag dolls it's hilarious uh the the best joke that i've ever heard oh that's i i wouldn't even be able to answer that one actually i don't think i'd be able to tell any of the best jokes i've heard on this thing i've been instructed to keep it moderately pg-13 so um 
what does a good day and a bad day look like for QDM? I'm gonna be honest, guys. I, I, uh, I really don't have that many bad days. Like, you get stuff that's broke down and and whatnot, and there's always you know challenges that you face throughout the course of a day. But a day is just kind of what you make out of it. You know, there's there's gonna be bad days where stuff breaks and cattle are out, and you're pulling calves and doing a bunch of different stuff. And then there's there's gonna be good days where you're basically doing the same thing. But I think what defines how your day is or what goes on is just kind of you know where your uh where your mind is at when you're doing it i mean a good attitude is going to make your day good kind of no matter how bad of a day you're having and vice versa you know what i mean um i don't know i kind of look at every day as a good day just because I, I get the opportunity to get out of bed and and go uh and go do my thing um uh, so the farm, Danny, uh, the farm that you're seeing on most of the quick deck stuff is, uh, is just between Foam Lake and Tufnell, a place called the Barra Ranch. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's just north of Highway 16 is, is where everything is there. My, my land that I own is, uh, is north of Tufnell, uh, between Tufnell and Margo kind of thing. So it's like a little, draw a little triangle between, uh, Foam Lake, Margo and Tufnell. That's kind of our area there. Um. If I could choose between invisibility and ability to fly, what would you choose? Oh, I'd fly. I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely fly. I've always wanted to just be able to fly everywhere because you get a better perspective on the earth from a little bit up higher than uh, than on the ground. Um, and you can get places faster. Like, I mean, I try and snowmobile everywhere with Rolly because you can kind of go as the crow flies, but then you're limited by barbed wire fence of where you can and can't go. If you could fly, well, then you wouldn't have to worry about the fence, right? And I feel like invisibility would get me into a little bit too much trouble. So, um, tell us about your farm. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, Kira and Kendra both. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's cattle and grain farm. The bar our ranch is actually owned by a guy named Mark. Um, and yeah, there's uh, there's 300 head of cattle, and we're getting to be right in around the 4,000 uh, croppable acres there. And uh, there's the two of us that are out there. And uh, he's got his family there. Uh, the kids help with harvest and whatnot. And it's uh, it's a it's a busy place and busy times. I actually, we're getting uh, peas cleaned for seed here this morning. I'm in between loads right now to stop in and do this here. Uh, Danny, wife? Question mark? No, I do not have a wife. I do not have a girlfriend. I do not have kids that I know of. Um, yeah, just just me. How do I truly feel about Tim Hortons coffee? I, I like. I'm not much of a coffee snob, I guess, to be honest. I uh, The thing I can't stand about Tim Hortons is it seems to be the only organization in the country that can completely impede traffic with the lineups trying to get into it. Has anybody ever noticed this? Like, you'd be driving, say you go to Yorkton and you're trying to get to PV Mart or something like that, and you're trying to go around a corner and there's four cars blocking off an intersection and you can't get through it, and you're like, what's going on? Was there some kind of a car accident here? And it turns out it's just a lineup for Tim Hortons and people are okay with that. Like, people are okay with a lineup blocking everything off to be able to get around Tim Hortons. But, I mean, heaven forbid one person be walking through a crosswalk or something like that. Everybody gets all bent out of shape. It's very strange, eh? Yes, Tim Hortons is above the law, and I don't know why either. Yeah, drive through lines are weird. All kinds of lines are weird. But it's just, it's kind of shocking to me that people line up for coffee when you can just stop by a dingy gas station and get one that's been, you know, sitting in a thermos for a couple of hours kind of thing. I mean, I'm just, I'm the, I'm the least coffee snob on planet earth. Uh, rock, paper, coffee, never heard it. Yes. Cold elevator coffee is the best, but I mean, ele the thing that makes elevator coffee the best is that it's the conversation that you're having with everybody that's around the elevator at the time. You know what I mean? As, as far as I'm concerned, anyways, uh, Oh man, see now it's well. St Steve, hit me up in the in the. I'll it's Janine. I'll be able to let you know how to get a how to get all the there. Um, favorite thing to favorite thing to eat for lunch in the field. You're gonna find this very strange, but I uh, I I take I take oats like every morning. I just keep a tub of oats with me, and when I get hungry, I eat it, and then everything else I'll either eat out of a can or like I'll. Oh, man, I got this crazy thing where I got, like, frozen chicken or I'll have frozen beef or whatever just in the freezer. And I will, like, grab three bags of just meat and a tub of oats 
and then go uh, and then go out into the field. And by the time I'm hungry enough to eat them, they've thawed, and I just start mowing down. Yeah, I don't have a very specific diet or anything like that. Michelle, looks like you're cracking the time whip here. Sorry, yeah, gotta crack the whip, guys. <laughs> that's 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 fine. I was I needed a minute to grab a drink of my low rate coffee, anyways. Well, thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks for the awesome questions. That was fun. Oh <laughs> man, yeah, that was. Thought you'd actually get to ask. That was rapid fire, eh? And we'll have to figure out what this rock paper coffee is, because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, rock rock paper coffee. I've always just rock paper scissors, or you could cheat and go rock paper dynamite. But I've never heard of rock paper coffee. I feel like it could get messy and hot very quickly. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you were able to take something away. If not, I hope you just had a good time. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to the people who invited you or to any of your cargo reps. Big Dick McDick, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, again, oh, thanks for having the me. Recording, please let us know. Look forward to seeing the rest of your videos. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You guys take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.